What shall we talk about? Well, I think a good thing to talk about would be trauma and work and life. And not just trauma, but the, the difficulties that people are facing in their personal lives, be it mental illness, trauma related or otherwise neurodivergence, relationship issues, and how they still manage to keep going at any level on a work level, and how we can relate to people and work in that sort of context. What kind of assumptions do we make? What expectations do we make? I think that's a good thing to talk about. Please. Anything in particular you want to start off with? So I've made it public, you know, through my writing and through a couple of talks um, that, that I've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder um, early last year, 2022. So I was actually diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and, and to cut a long story short, what happened was a few months before that, in 2021, I went to the doctors and actually had a problem with my Achilles heel. Couldn't kind of walk properly. It was very painful. I, I couldn't lift it. I thought it had stretched it or damaged it. I went to the doctor and it started to kind of heal. But anyway, I went to the doctor and said, I've got a problem with my Achilles heel and checked it out. And it hadn't like snapped or anything. So it was okay and it was, it was healing. While I was there, I said, oh, and there's another issue. I forget what it was, but I usually go to the doctors with things in threes. I think a lot of people do that, save them up, you know. And so I talked about this other issue, whatever it was. I think I'd had some blood tests and I just need to get the results. And then as I was about to walk out, I just said the letters PTSD. So as I say that now, every time I say that, it's really difficult to say those letters because the same thing happens as what happened in that doctor's surgery that I just, there's a block kind of in my chest and throat. I can't speak anymore. So. so I have to take a deep breath before I say that, actually, just like I did then. I take a deep breath and then I say it. That's the only way it can kind of come out. So on that day then, I said it and I was crying and, and I was just sort of frozen, really. The doctor was brilliant. She, she was just exemplary she was excellent she just gave me time just space because i said because i only literally said i know you're busy and i, I, said, I said i'll, I'll get going it was like because i know i've only got five minutes with doctors nowadays whatever and she created space and time and said what's happened and i said well what's not happened i went through so many things but there were all things that happened between the ages of like mid-teens up to about 26 over about a 12-year period they weren't recent really um, and so she actually prescribed me antidepressants, uh, but I wasn't really keen on that. I tried them before in the past and they didn't agree with me. I just didn't like them, you know? So anyway, I did start to take them, but I was pretty much asleep for days. And so I stopped them. I just thought, I don't like this, you know? And I didn't feel that necessarily I was depressed. It doesn't feel quite, quite, quite right, but... Anyway, she referred me and I got assessed some month later. I think it was February 2022 and I was, I was diagnosed with complex PTSD, which I knew I had PTSD. I didn't know I had complex PTSD. I'd never heard of it, didn't know what it was. And when I read more about it, I certainly didn't want that. It was not the diagnosis that I wanted. So yeah, I discovered that not only had I had chronic 
multiple PTSDs throughout my teens and 20s, multiple traumas um, involving violence, death, loss, accident, a very bad car accident. Um, um, but I still had it. They'd all built on top of each other like a layer cake, starting in my childhood, you know. Um, going on through my teens with multiple events and then carried through my nervous system. And here I was now as like a, what, 47 year old guy now with complex PTSD about things that happened in my teens and twenties. And what this has made me think about is how we've got no idea what's going on in the background of the people that we meet, how much we expect of them from my teens to late twenties. I was pretty high performing at university, did PhD, did master degrees, all that kind of stuff. Quite you now reasonably high performing at, you know, at work. And yet in the background is all of this stuff. And so what I'm quite curious about is people who have so much stuff in the background, whether they're neurodivergent, which, you know, now I'm, I have this sort of acquired neurodivergence, which has features of autism, it has features of ADHD, but ultimately it's complex PTSD, you know, um, and I've got a daughter with autism who's autistic and I've got a daughter with ADHD. So I've learned quite a bit about those as well. I've got lots of autism in my family and ADHD in my hip family. What I often think about now is how much we expect of people and how we judge people for small things. You might forget something at work. You might not reply to an email. You might not have everything organized perfectly. In other words, you're not performing like a, a machine like we sometimes expect people to and yet there's so much um, trauma mental illness and neurodivergence that creates invisible disabilities in people that we judge them for even though we don't know they have them and so we expect people to perform like machines you know We've talked, we've talked about technique and efficiency. So we expect people to perform like this without knowing all of this stuff that can be going on in the background. I think, um, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, and my, my question is, is you know, you, you talked about this idea of we expect, and you've said this a few times already, we expect people to, to perform in a particular way. And the question really is that, where does that expectation actually come from? Now, how do we come to expect all this? Clearly, this is, you know, we are, we are, we are caught up in a paradigm or in a worldview where all this is considered okay. And that's why we do it, right? So what is the source of all these expectations in your view? Yeah, it's a good question. But our lives have become revolved around work i think our meaning is derived from work you know i learned that lesson very early on because i grew up in a family business uh, and that's about survival because if the business doesn't fight survive you know you're in you're in big trouble you've got the, all of these staff as well that you employ so we had a number of s small shops and a little distribution business it was a very high stress upbringing constant stress and the the, the main thing we that i learned was you have to work hard all the time and that's your value in that context what it meant was physical work because intellectual work was not prized at all I, I was in a working class family no one ever went to university in my family history i was the first so you just had to physically show how you could work like a machine the more you could work the better person you were um, so that's where it kind of came from. And we see this in society now. It's just produce, produce, produce. And consume, um, and consume, consume, consume. There's no space 
or much else rest it's art yeah it's interesting you should say that because this morning i had a i did a podcast with rob uh, in australia and we discussed this whole idea of of technique and efficiency in in, in great length and uh, also a podcast will be released in time but you know what what intrigues me uh, from what you have been consistently saying from the start is that the technique has become you know has 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 been there since the, the, the start of the mankind but in a way it's become an ideology and a religion it's become an ideology that we all live by now that nobody questions technique and efficiency anymore it's uh, it's a force on its own it's an archetype on its own you know you use the word archetype so many times in your work and once it it it, it gathers the, the energy of an archetype it also creates a mythology that comes with it mm -hmm. that this is considered efficient and this is not considered efficient although we know that you know sitting on our on a social media platform all day just boosting our egos or, or or looking for likes and shares is probably not the most efficient way of life but such is the power of technique that it decides what is right and what is wrong so it's quite okay to do that within the mythology of technique and I find that very powerful, actually. Or investing in weapons of mass destruction. It doesn't sound like an efficient thing to do, but it's all within the discourse of technique. You know, there are some mm. inter internal contradictions here, but, you know, even Heidegger spoke about it. Spoke about it. But I find it so powerful when you say that uh, we expect people to perform, perform, and perform. In, in fact, you know, this whole idea of performance is a very interesting one, because in one way, you have to put on a show. Yeah. Right? That doesn't matter what you're going through. The show must go on. I can't remember that that song from one of the very famous singers who was diagnosed with cancer on the day. And he was, he you know, he knew that he had very limited time and he had to sing this song, which was the show must go on. I don't know the name of the singer, but such a powerful video to watch, Steve. Uh, mm. How you have to put up with this idea of technique and you have to must and you must perform. The other thing I find interesting within the same discourse of technique is, which is, you know, it doesn't matter what, what you're going through. Look at the framing of the questions in, in, in the risk and safety world. What makes work difficult? And to your point that how much of our, how, what, what a worldview that is so stuck, so anchored on this concept of work. And if the other person turns around and says, a bully manager or sexual harassment by my supervisor, we have no words, absolutely none. So we are, we are caught up in this paradigm where we have to put up a show, we have to put on a show regardless of what is going on in our lives. Uh, you mm. know, there's an English expression which is, how are you doing today? And the answer is not too bad. And what does that even mean? You know, in, in, in Hindi, mm. a, a greeting is namaste, and the other person says namaste, which means that, you know, the God in me uh, respects the God in you. So there's some meaning to that greeting, right? But mm. what a greeting mm. we have created, you know, it's like complete disregard to your personhood, regardless of what you're going through in life, I'm not interested. Mm. My greeting itself is so superficial to you. Yeah. Is, yeah, so, yeah. I don't know yeah. what you have to say about this. Yeah, well, last year and, 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 and this this year um, lost some people in my life. So there were two people who were like, they were like grandparents. The, the biological relation wasn't. Um, the, 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 the woman was my second cousin. We called her auntie, my dad's cousin but the age difference and so on and they lived around the corner it was they were like grandparents the relationship was a grandparent and i was around there very often not least um and they died you know and this is in their 90s and they died within a few weeks of each other you know they were in love until the end they were absolutely love story from being 17. um they died and then 
Richard Cook, who was a friend of mine and anesthesiologist and safety scientist, uh, he, he died. And this just made me think about what will we regret when we die? When I was diagnosed with PTSD, in fact, before I was diagnosed with PTSD, it was before I knew I had PTSD. I hadn't been diagnosed with CPTSD, but I knew I had PTSD. And I'd never written poem, poetry before. I had no interest in poetry. My relationship with, with art was completely blocked by PTSD because I grew up an artist snipping. I was not in engineering or science. I had no interest whatsoever in that. Not. I was interested in art, craft, writing, and listening to people. That's all I was interested in. And then the humanities, that's what I was interested in as a child. And I used to paint and draw and I was a good artist. And I used pastels and so on. And um, my capacity for that was 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 completely blocked by PTSD. But anyway, before I was diagnosed, I knew I had PTSD. And I started to write poetry. Furiously writing. I mean furiously as in I wrote an unbelievable amount of poetry. I've never written a poem. I didn't know what a poem was. I wrote all of this poetry. And and I published, put some online on a little blog called PTSDs um, on WordPress about all of the experiences, different experiences I've had involving, you know, violence and, and, and loss and accidents and all sorts of this stuff, you know. And one of them was called No One Ever Dies Wishing. Right, no one ever dies wishing. I don't know if I ever showed you this poem. No. Um, Would you like to share with me? Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll just find it just just now um, because it should be easy easy enough to 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 find. So the 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 blog site where you can find these poems is called PTS Days dot home dot blog so ptsdays dot home I will include dot, in the podcast, yes. dot blog so th these are like it's strange for me to look at these poems now because I couldn't write them now right now I don't think so I wrote all of these within about four weeks a few weeks anyway I don't know it was within a short time you know they were about all kinds of stuff that happened, but one of them was called No One Ever Dies Wishing. I'm not a poet, you know. I don't have any training or anything in writing poetry. I just wrote all of this stuff, and then I stopped writing it. Um, it was called No One Ever Died Wishing, and it goes, um, no one ever died wishing they'd stayed longer at the office, uh, tapping at keys and staring at screens, sand trickling away into corporate machines. No one ever died wishing they'd fitted in more shopping. Malls and sites serving corporate greed, once suffocating basic needs. No one ever died wishing they'd spent more time on devices, tapping and zooming and clicking and scrolling, addicted, distracted, weary eyes rolling. No one ever died wishing they'd watched more television, chewing gum soaps and horror show news scenes, neighbours unmet, strangers on widescreen. People die wishing they'd stayed in touch with their friends, a phone call, a visit, sometimes spent together, knowing that you and they won't live together forever. People die wishing they'd expressed how they felt. I'm sorry, I'm angry. I'm hurting, I love you. Opened a door for feelings to pass through. People die wishing they'd taken risks, made decisions, traveled, changed job, conquered their fears, not staying in a rut for so many years. People die wishing they'd lived true to themselves with authenticity and meaning, sensation and feeling. That was 2018. I, I knew at that point, you know, that I had PTSD, but no one else did. You know, all anybody saw was this, you know, fairly high-performing guy, right? 
um, who produced good stuff and was able to be a very good father, very productive, you know, effective. Um, they couldn't see all of this stuff that I that I put into 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 poems. So that just brings me back to this original point about you know when you send an email to someone and they don't reply straight away, or if not reply to your text, or they don't seem as organised, or they've missed a detail on something, you've no clue. You've really got no idea what is going on in their lives, whether they have, you know, like whatever issues, relational issues, whether there's got some kind of mental uh, illness or trauma or neurodivergence that makes something like answering an email very, very difficult, you know, or planning your day very, very difficult. So that's one side of it. But the other side is, you know, what I learned, it, like, it's happened more recently, you know, younger people that I know die, people in their 30s, 40s, you know, my, my mother was 45 when she died, younger than me. The, the time and energy that we put into technique, as you say, you know, coming to understand what you mean about that, it's like, is that what you're going to regret? What are you going to regret? Because it could be tomorrow, right? Could be tomorrow. What are you going to regret? And work on that stuff. And even that word, work on that stuff. You can see how it's just taken over the whole way that we think we have to work on stuff. You know? We won't regret. Kind of, oh, we should have just stayed in the office a bit more we should have just produced more that's not the stuff so how do we create the space to look at all of this thing Say again? Do you want to say more? No, that's my question. You know, how do we create space for the stuff that really matters? You've got so many days off from your work. Even that, like days off. What have you got? If you're in America, you might have five or ten days off if you're lucky. What is crazy? You know, uh, I had a job in Australia as an academic, uh, 20 days off, now I have a little bit more. Um, yeah, I don't know, you know. Yeah. Just, just, just on that, Steve, just one small comment to say. Frederick Taylor, you know, the so-called father of scientific management, actually had a stopwatch in his hand at the time when he was dying. And wow. What are you counting when there is nothing left in life anyway? Mm. That is the problem of technique and efficiency. That it comes to dominate you in ways that you don't even know that there is another world that exists. And, you know, Steve, I find it so, so helpful to just go on an evening walk and sit in the graveyard for 15, 20 minutes and just watch people as they come to lay flowers, put water, just watch their loved ones, you know, resting in peace. I think there is a realization with some people at least that this is life. This is what it is. And that's what I shared with you yesterday, uh, sitting there. Yeah, yeah. And my, I wrote a post about this. One of my favorite places is, 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 is a graveyard. It's overgrown. It's 
I wrote a post called um, On Living and Dying. There were two parts to it. And one has pictures of this graveyard, you know, all completely overgrown. And it is a great reminder, you know, looking on the graves at what's written and so on. Um, but, you know, like sometimes I'll find myself on a walk and like that. And, but you're thinking of the time. How long have I got? Should I not, shouldn't I be doing something else? That so we've got those priorities all mixed up. That guilt often strikes me when I'm sitting there. Why am I sitting idle? And this is, this is what Rob said in the morning when I was talking to him. He said, there are these indigenous people who would sit and sit and sit for three hours and have conversations. Mm. And for them, that's not a waste of time. That's a way of life. That's how life should be lived. And yeah, so true, yes. Even this idea of wasting time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What does that, what, what does that mean? Because what it, it, it puts a value that we don't question. But that's the one that I grew up with. Produce, produce, do, do, do. There wasn't, there's no space for being, just doing. Um, and I think many of us do, at least through school. If you're not convinced at home, you're, you're, you're really taught this at school, you know, that your worth is what you can produce and perform, right? And you get marked for it. You get marked out of 10 or out of 20 or A, B, C, D, or whatever. And so it's very clear. Um, there's no space for relating. There's no space for your gifts to be revealed and given because your gifts are really not relevant. My gifts when I was young, as I said, were drawing and painting, writing, listening to people. I was a kid and I used to find out adults to talk to and listen to. You know, I loved that about their lives and so on. Now I do that with taxi drivers. That's my best conversations. Usually. Yes, you yes, know? Um, but there's no space for that in no. well, it's not valued. It's not, but, but you see, this is the thing that when you start to look at something like technique or efficiency as, as an archetype, as a worldview, as a way of seeing the world, as a way of living and being in the world, I think what you tend to liberate yourself from is, you know, like, for example, the Tahitians did not have a concept for grief until 1950s. So... So anyone would die in the community and they would feel very, very sick, very, very sick until an anthropologist went there to see what was going on. And he called it grief and he made them understand that this is grief. So now they have a word for it. And in the same way that, you know, now that you have you have a finger on it, that this is what it is, whether you call it PTSD or, or technique. You have a way to liberate yourself from it because you can. You, there are times when you can watch it from the outside and see what's going on, and I think that is the remarkable. You don't have a solution. You know these are these are these problems have no solutions, but at least you can be in the moment. You can be more mindful about what's going on here, and I think mm -hmm. that acknowledgement, that prophecy. You know, prophecy is a very religious word, but that's not what it means. It basically means it means. Uh, telling or being able to to give something a name, naming naming is prophecy actually yes, and I think that ability to to name something is very liberating, very liberating in my view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely it is. But it, I think it often takes some kind of trauma or traumatic awakening to 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 reach that point. Because the starting point is denial and anger, right? Before mm -hmm. you even come to name something. So yeah, going yeah. through that cycle, some people are just stuck in that denial and anger forever. But once you start to recognize it and name it, and there are people around you to help you come out of that cycle, I think that's another discussion, of course. But I think that is that is a very healing process, very healing process. Mm -hmm. Knowing that, you know, even... Yeah. Knowing that there have been people who have been through it before me and there will be people who face it in the future is, is also 
is also very healing, right? Very, very, there's a sense of relief there as well. There, there is. I mean, like coming back to the PTSD thing, I spoke openly about it at two conferences, one aviation related on critical incident stress management, and another was a healthcare conference. But the healthcare conference in particular was quite a big conference, and I had many people come up to me afterwards. I didn't find giving the talk too difficult. There are some parts that are hard, because I can't get the words out easily. But I didn't find the talk too difficult. Afterwards, that was quite difficult, because I had people come up to me, paramedics, psychiatrists, partners of psychiatrists, critical care nurses, others saying, that's what I have. I didn't talk about the complex part of PTSD very much. I talked about plain PTSD, which I've experienced multiple times and built on each other. But there's so much of it. And they basically said they've never really spoke to each other, to anyone about it. And said, my partner has this and has never spoke to anyone. And it's there in the background. It lives in you like a virus. You know, that's what it is. It's like a virus that attaches itself. It just lives, like it's a burden. Um, and um, yeah, we just don't talk, we don't talk about it. It's like, I also have a sort of scoliosis, you know, a little bit. I've had that issues. It's okay to talk about that. I mean, that's fine. You could have frozen shoulder, you could have knee pain. It doesn't matter, whatever it is, you can talk about anything that's physical. Funnily enough, once I started to address PTSD, my back problems started to leave as well. My hips, which were twisted, and my shoulders, which were very uneven, about one to two inches. My shoulders became straight. My hips started to level out. Amazing. You know, once you start to work on these kinds of things that we hold in the body. It's, it's an embodied mind. It's an, we are all embodied, isn't it? It's, yeah. It's, 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 it lives in the body. It is. It's, it's, yeah, absolutely. What a wonderful conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's... it's very healing to me, at least. I mean, seeing that there are so many commonalities between your experience and what, yeah. yeah. Mm. There's more awareness of trauma now. That comes with the downside. You have all of this trauma-informed everything, again, turned over to technique, you might say. Everything's now trauma-informed. People don't necessarily understand trauma at all. I'm actually not sure. I'm not. I'm not quite sure how you can really understand trauma unless you've faced it. You know, because how do you know? Trauma for me is a wound. That's the best way. It's an internal wound. It's never healed. It's a wound, and it's like it's quite hard to know what a wound feels like. Yeah, and I, and I find Gabor made particularly helpful here mm. because he talks about two kinds of traumas. One is the trauma with a big T, you know, which comes in the form of what you've experienced, for example, mm. is often, uh, which is very severe, uh, but there is the trauma with a small T, which we all go through each day, every day, as someone shouts at us, judges us, condemns yeah. us, you know, or, or even instructs or tells us something in the ways that we don't like. So that is also a form of trauma because anything yeah. that holds you back in the past and doesn't let you, you know, do the sense making and doesn't let you to, to understand the world around you is trauma, is mm. trauma. Uh, because it's it's stopping you to think. Um, and it and is. Back. Yes. So Th this this one when it occurs in childhood repeatedly, it's an emotional death by a thousand cuts. Um, people experience that with CPSD, CPTSD, whether it's neglect or abuse, um, and. It is a sort of emotional death. It, it, it's and it is this kind of. It, it could be things that individually the events are actually not considered big T traumas. Um, but you inherit a view of the world that it is dangerous and unpredictable and untrustworthy and and, and so on. Um, and then later in life, those small T traumas. Produce, can produce a disproportionate effect because you're now back without realizing in an alternative um, 
like um, hourglass that's got stuck. You know, you're not in the hourglass in the middle anymore where the sand is flowing. You're in another one where it just stopped. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, like being mindful to that in day to day life, that if you shout at someone, insult them, you've no, you've no idea about what the effects of that could be. It could seem like a small thing, you know, um, for the person, it could be a huge thing. It could, we talk about triggers, again, a word that's been totally hijacked to mean offence. It's nothing to do with offence. It means it's taking you back to that original trauma. That's what triggered means, you know. So like for me, hearing a motorbike, a certain type of motorbike makes me cry automatically. Hearing an ambulance makes me very scared and furious, you know. Yeah, there are certain memories in life which I hope I'll never see the cues off again in my life. Uh, it just pulls you back straight into that, yes. Um, Steve, if we were to, to put an end to this conversation, what is it that you would like to say in ending? I don't like the word conclusion, but what would you like to say as we end this? Um, it's... Part of it, what I've been thinking about lately, is just give people a break. Give people a break. Because, so I don't want to say be kind, because that word, again, that phrase has been totally hijacked and become almost meaningless. But you've, you've, you've got no clue what people go, go, are going through. And it's happened to me a few times recently. You know, you, um, you don't receive an email, and so you may respond in a certain way, but you've not received the email. And, and the other person says, why on earth? If you, you know, they respond in an angry way as if you've deliberately ignored them. Well, what's more likely? Right. Or you've, you know, just a small, just like small things to do with technique and efficiency, right, to, to bring that back in. Where the machine doesn't work, in the way that it should mechanically, right? Give people a break because we're not machines and we're not in a machine world. We've just sort of created the illusion of one, you know? So just be gentle with people and assume that, assume goodwill, assume that people are trying to do the best in sometimes formidable circumstances, you know, it's that, it's a wonder they're doing that. It's amazing they're doing even half of the job that they're doing. Amazing. But you know, Steve, um, my, my main concern is that um, unless you have a way of life, unless you have a way of life that acknowledges the other person, that sees in the other person, a human person, um, no matter how hard we try, uh, people will default to to uh, treating another person as a, as as a machine, you mm. have to come from a position of seeing another person as a complete human person with their Absolutely. unique personhood, with their unique challenges, with their unique problems, with the unique bag that they carry, their histories, their motivations, their dreams. Their, you know, it's it's a, and quite often we don't do that. We don't even have the intelligence to step into another person's shoes and see life from their perspective. It's it's almost impossible for many people in position of power and authority, and particularly those people who need to do it even more. And so I think this whole idea, the, the jargon that comes with leadership around humility and authenticity and 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 and, and authenticity, well and, and and curiosity if you like to to understand the other person becomes so hollow if we don't have an ethic of personhood. Mm. And which is Absolutely. why I admire your work that you draw from Carl Rogers, which is mm. very humanistic. Yes. And I think that is what we need today, more than ever. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Humanistic psychology really was drowned out by cognitive psychology, which mechanized people. It reduces, again, technique. 
and then that, and then neuropsychology and so on. And it's like you really lost the essence of what it is to be a person. We're now brains with hands. That's right. It's a good place to end. Thanks, Nippin. <laughs>